In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of Daniel, and we are continuing our little mini-series in the book of Daniel. Now, just to understand where we are, Daniel right now is offering a prayer to God. And the focus of this prayer is primarily how Israel disobeyed him and was taken away to Babylon. Remember that Daniel is one of the people that was taken from Jerusalem to serve in Babylon. And now it's a little bit later, he's a little bit older, and he's sort of looking back and looking at some of the mistakes that his nation made and what led them to that position that they were no longer the masters of their own kingdom. That they no longer had the freedom as a nation that they once enjoyed back when they were under King David and King Solomon and sort of the glory days, the golden age of Israel. And so Daniel is very upset about this, and rightfully so, and, and he continues on his prayer and explaining some of this in Daniel chapter 9, verses 13 through 14, where he says, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds, which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. We talked about a theme in this prayer that continues, and it's very prevalent in this verse as well. Because if you look at the verse, Daniel is very clear in saying that God made a promise with Israel, and he's not going to break his word. So if the promise is not being upheld then it's obviously our fault, not God's. If we are not being able to experience the benefits of what God promised us, it's because we broke the promise ourselves, not because God is being unfaithful. And so that's something that continues on, but I want you to look specifically at a small part of that that really jumps out in this verse. That he talks about that even though they have seen the calamity, and the punishment has already started, that they still have not gone back to God, that they have not, as Daniel says, turned from their iniquity and given attention to his truth. Now, before he was talking about the initial part of that, that Israel was taken away into captivity because of how they behaved before the captivity. But he's shifting gears just a little bit here. And now he's talking about even though the calamity has come, even though we've been taken away from our homeland of, of Israel, we still are not back where we were supposed to be. And the reason that we're not is because we still haven't repented. We still haven't turned from our evil ways. We still haven't returned to God's truth. Now think about that. We're not sure exactly, we have a pretty good idea, but we're not sure exactly how long Israel had been in captivity at the point that he is writing this particular prayer. But it's been a while. It has been a while because we know, based on the timeline that Daniel gives us at the beginning of this chapter, we have a pretty good idea of how long Israel has been in captivity at this point. It's been decades. And Daniel is saying, even though they're seeing the results of their own actions. Even though they are seeing that their own iniquities have led to sin and weakness and has led to this great calamity, they're still not doing the right thing. They're still not obeying God. They're seeing the results of not listening to God's warnings, and they're continuing to not listen to God's warnings. Why? Because people are stubborn. Because people don't like to admit that they're wrong. And nine times out of ten, even though as an outside observer we can look at someone else doing it and see how childish and dumb it is, what's the first thing that we do when something bad happens to us? 
start pointing fingers, blaming people around us. We can blame the circumstance. We can blame people that had something to do with it. But that's usually our first reaction. Almost always. And it seems as though Israel was doing pretty much the same thing. When they saw this calamity happening, they were sorrowful, they were lamenting, they didn't like being in captivity. But instead of immediately turning back to God and apologizing, what Daniel's saying is there are people in the kingdom right now that they're still not living the way God told them to. They still haven't repented. They still haven't realized that they were the reason this happened. Because human beings are stubborn and we hate to admit when we're wrong. And believe me, when it comes to admitting that you're wrong, I have a really hard time with that. It's probably the reason I'm in talk radio right now. I like to be right. I hope that I'm right at least most of the time, even though I know I've been wrong in the past before. But I think that we all need to take a step back from time to time, and if our circumstances are less than ideal, if there's something that's wrong, we don't need to start pointing fingers, blaming other people, or especially blaming God. Sometimes the best thing that we can do is step back and say, what did I mess up on? What could I have done better? Sometimes this is true even when we actually are the victim. Now, in this case, we know that it was Israel's fault and that it was Israel's own lack of faith and lack of obedience that led to this, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes terrible things happen. Sometimes you lose a child or get cancer or have some kind of horrible accident. That's life. Sometimes it's the result of things we do. Sometimes it's not. But in both circumstances, even when we're the victim, even when we really didn't do anything wrong and we're blameless, sometimes it's still a good idea to take a step back and think, what could I have done different? Could I have done something better? Is there anything that I could have done to avoid the circumstance? And what Daniel's pointing out here is, this is a situation where they knew they were doing wrong, and God sent messenger after messenger, he sent prophet after prophet, he wrote it in the law, he told them what they were doing wrong, he told them how to live righteously, he told them how to be obedient to the law and reap the rewards of that, and they had every signpost, had no excuses, and they still aren't repenting. They still aren't realizing that they're the problem. And that is really a sad place to be. Because human beings do hate admitting that we've messed up. It's a very hard thing to do. But it's the most important step. It's the thing that we need to do the most. And right now, with what's going on with Daniel, it's the thing that Israel is unwilling to do. And until that happens, there's not really anything he can do to help them. And that's horrible, and he hates it, but he realizes that God's doing everything he can. He's done more than his fair share of warning and calls to repentance. And ultimately, it's up to the people, and right now, they just don't want to hear it. Now, we know with hindsight that eventually they do, that eventually they do repent and they are eventually returned to their homeland. But it hasn't happened quite yet. See, Daniel got frustrated because he saw his people not getting it even though it was really obvious. They had the old law, they had the prophets, they had all of these advantages that frankly other nations just didn't. They didn't have that really special covenant relationship with God that started with Abraham and went all the way to them. Other nations didn't have that. And yet here is Israel, who's supposed to be God's chosen people, who's supposed to be a representative of what living a godly life is supposed to be like on earth, and they're refusing to even admit that they made a mistake. You see, I think what this all really boils down to is that Daniel was getting frustrated because he had lost his patience with Israel too. And isn't that really ironic? That Daniel, realizing that he's not perfect and knows that he doesn't always live exactly the way that he's supposed to, yet still is living righteously and understands why Israel is in captivity and why God is upset with them, 
that he's getting frustrated and impatient with Israel when he's a flawed human being himself. Imagine how God feels. God, who has done all these things, who has given them every opportunity, multiple chances to repent, multiple messengers, many of whom the Israelites killed because they didn't like what they were saying, that they're rejecting God and Daniel is upset. How do you think God feels when he's the one being rejected and he's the one that put in all the effort to win Israel back? You see, I think that there's a powerful lesson there for us as well. That when we're caught up in a sin or a temptation, or we're dealing with somebody else that is, and we get so frustrated, it's so obvious, why can't they see this? Why can't they see that this is a bad situation? Why can't they see that there is a better way to live? Let's sit back and remember that God is patient with us. and We need to be patient with other people too. I think maybe Daniel praying this prayer, if I had to guess, probably helped him out with that a little bit. Remembering that God has been patient with him in his own personal life. And that as a result, he needs to be patient with other people as well and trust that God knows what he's doing. You see, that's why pride is so incredibly deadly. Because it not only causes us to sin, it not only causes some of the sins and some of the problems in our life, but it also blinds us to that sin. It's bad enough that it causes us to commit atrocities against God and diso being disobedient to Him. But what's even worse is, if we have enough pride, it can cause us to not even realize we're engaging in it. And it can blind us to our own awareness that we've messed up, like what happened with Israel here refusing to even admit that they did anything wrong. And the longer that pride stays there, the harder it is to admit that you were wrong, and the harder it's going to be to come back. And so I think that we need to follow Daniel's example and be patient and humble ourselves in God's sight so that we can realize when we've made these mistakes and when we need to correct them. Stay the course, friends. <laughs>